Some years ago, we had a brother that worshipped with us, and he went off up into the area of Wyoming and Montana to work with some churches up there. And he called me and he said, I, I want you to come up and hold some meetings for us. I got on an airplane and I got off in just south of the North Pole. <laughs> Brother Norm said he had spent three winters up there one year. And I knew exactly what he meant. But he spent enough winters up there that by the time I got off the airplane, he'd got on a different airplane and already left. And so I met with a group of brethren that I'd never seen him before in my life. We met in the basement of a man's house. And one of the brothers got up to lead singing and he said, Brethren, let's sing this like we live, hard and fast. And I had no idea what I'd just got myself into. I've always laughed. If they didn't live any harder and faster than they sang that song, they were in no trouble at all. But it was a good little group. And I enjoyed the week that I spent with them. And we studied and talked and prayed. And they were trying to be a light in that community. As Jesus had said, you are a light unto the world. He said that we are to let our light shine so that the community, the world that we live in would see our good deeds and thus would glorify our God in heaven. Paul said, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all unto the very glory of God. So I finished my work and I came back down to the sunny, warm south. And a couple of years later, I got a call and they said, we'd like you to come back up. So I picked a different time of year and I did go back up. In my absence, they had moved out of the brother's basement and they'd bought a little building. They put up a little sign and they let everybody in that community know we're God's people right here. And when I gathered with them on Sunday morning, I noticed there was less than half of the number that had been there the first time I was there. And they were meeting in a basement. Not knowing any better, I just asked them, what did you do? And they'd had a problem that had arisen over what they thought they could or could not do as a congregation. And they had called a business meeting. And in the business meeting, two of the brothers began pressing their points. Until finally it escalated into a Wyoming fistfight. Outside the building and down the hill and the cops came. And small town news, it made the news. That church is not there anymore. Most of the brethren have either become discouraged and quit. Or taken different jobs and moved to different parts of the world But that's what happens if we're not careful how we live. We represent to the world God. We do not simply represent ourselves and the things that we say and the things that we do and how we conduct ourselves. It has much more to do than just with our character and with our reputation. For we are God's people in this world. Because of that, we're actually representing not ourselves, but we're representing God. And we need to behave ourselves in all venues of life 
knowing that people will observe and they will watch. And we will influence them, whether positively or negatively, by what we do. And we live in a world that is going to have just continual controversy, particularly over the concept of moral issues. This past week, Many of you are, are fans of Duck Dynasty. They ask the head duck, knowing that he is a very conservative, religious man, how he felt about homosexuality. My first reaction is, if you don't want to know, don't ask. But they ask, and he was in blunt terms, told them, here's how I feel about it. Many of you have read what he said. If you're not, it's freely available on the internet. The interesting thing was reading the news. For example, CNN reported that Duck Dynasty star was in an anti-gay rant. I had to go back and read what he said again, and I'm going, huh, their definition of rant is a lot different than my understanding of that particular word. Their program is on A&E, so A&E apologized for this man's opinion, and then said, he's off the show. Cracker Barrel, upon hearing all of this, removed the merchandise out of their stores because they did not want to be affiliated with that which was causing problems because their goal in life is to make people happy. And that was not making people happy. You know, the interesting thing was when they took all the merchandise out, that didn't make people happy either. And then... Marty Sheen made a comment. Many of you are probably going, Marty who? But if you are a star on a television show, even if it is a sitcom, it makes you an authority on moral issues facing American society. And so they can get quoted. Now what you won't see tomorrow morning is my quote. But I wouldn't care. Because I'm not going to talk about that. What you think and what you say, for most of us, is never going to make CNN news. But it will make Facebook. And it will make Twitter. And people that know you and know that you claim to be a follower of Jesus the Christ. And those that know that you have made your goal in life to live in a way that is going to honor and glorify God, they're going to read and they're going to see what you write. Now, some of you don't have computers, and some of you that have computers aren't on Facebook, but I know a lot of you are. And I'm going to tell you, what I did this week was, rather than reading the news, I just skipped over all of that, and I wanted to go down and read the comment section. And when you read the comment section on the article that is in CNN or ESPN or, or Fox News or MSNBC, it's disgusting. One of the things that you do not see and you will not see is a cordial discussion of what the issue is. Some on their Facebook page have written things that quite frankly they should not write. 
and claiming to be Christians, they ought to have written in a different tone, in a different manner. Turn with me to Second Tit- or Titus chapter 2. There's a parallel section in 2 Timothy, but I chose the one from Titus. I'm going to start at verse 1 of chapter 2. Paul told Titus, Speak you the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober-minded and grave and temperate, sound in faith and love and in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, but teachers of good things in order that they may teach the younger women to be sober-minded, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet and chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise exhort them to be sober-minded. And in all things show yourself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say about you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not uh, purloining or pilfering, but showing good faithfulness that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The emphasis that Paul put in this section is how we are to conduct ourselves, whether we are the old men or whether we are the old women. I don't know any old women. But wherever we are in this spectrum of life, we are God's representatives among the people that we live. And He exhorts us that our behavior is not measured by worldly standards of acceptability, but ours is measured by what God expects of His people. And we are to be sober-minded, serious, godly, and holy. And as we conduct ourselves in this, Paul reminded Titus, you're going to teach far more by your example than you will ever teach by your teaching. One of the old preachers one time wrote a young man and he said, you need to teach and you need to, and he went on and on and then at the end of the sentence he said, and if need be, use some words. And what he meant by that is what we've all found as parents. Our children sit and they watch and they absorb. And they learn to stand just like Daddy stands. And they learn to walk just like Daddy walks. And they learn to talk just like Daddy talks. And what happens is we're telling them, do this. And then we're showing them this. And they learn to be exactly like we are. And in our relationship to the world, we are to live our faith. First and foremost, there is an old song that we're going to sing. We are the world's Bible. Pay attention to what you're singing as we sing this. No so bright is blurred. And there was just a lot of blurry print this week. 
on both sides of the issue. But I did not expect any different from the world. One of my favorite quotes, a young preacher, Rick Seamus, made in a meeting here years ago. And he was talking about how worldly the world was and the ungodly and the things they said and what they did. And then he paused and he said, But what did you expect of the world? They are the world. But you're not. And that may be an excuse for them, but they will answer to God. But there is no excuse for us. In our dealing with the world, mark it down, we're going to have discussion and controversy. Wherever you go, when you tell people, here's my moral standard of what is acceptable, it won't be acceptable to them. But we're different. We're God's people. Paul told Titus from the English Standard Version. He not only was to be a model of good works. But in his teaching and his representation of God to the world. He was to do so with integrity. Integrity means I'm going to behave myself whether you do or not. Integrity means that I have a standard that I find acceptable and I'm going to live by that standard. Integrity means that even when the tough times come, I conduct myself not in reaction, but according to principle that I have avowed in my life. So Titus, even though he was a younger preacher, was told, you need to preach and you need to teach and you need to conduct yourself with integrity. The next word that Paul said is you need to do that with dignity or seriousness. This is one of the qualifications of being an elder. This is a qualification for us as being one of God's people in the world. That is, we take life and we take God and we take our religion as something that is not frivolous and can't be put in a box and put on a shelf, but it is serious. We approach it with no laughability. We cannot simply take it lightly as if it doesn't matter. But how we conduct ourselves is absolute importance to us. And as we talk and as we speak, this is not just preachers, because in your daily life, you're all preachers in your own way. For we shed forth the very glory of God by how we live God's Word. And so what we are supposed to do is to make sure that our speech is healthy. Old King James used the word sound over and over and over again, particularly in in Timothy and Titus. The newer translations recognize that we don't use the word sound the same way very often anymore. And so they they just gave it a, a, a newer nuance of that and what it means is that which is healthy and when we mean healthy we mean spiritually healthy so when we have a conversation we need to use words and speech and manners of expression that are spiritually healthy there are things that we can say and do as the old expression goes, that will poison the well. It will ruin relationships and it will cause problems. And what we're desiring is that which promotes God's spiritual health. And one of the problems we face as we deal with that is 
The world wants to define what Christianity and spiritual health is. I read a guy, and he was writing about this situation, and he he just spewed all over the page about how evil and vile this man was for what he said. And then he redefined and he said, because we all know that Christianity is... And then he redefined it to mean it has no moral standings and everything is acceptable and we just love everybody regardless of how ungodly they may be. But that is not God's definition of soundness and healthiness and what God's people are. But we are to speak that which is healthy. That which is going to help the people that we're talking to. And we need to do it in such a way, Paul said, that it cannot then be turned back against us and we are thus condemned. Interesting. One young lady, in response to all of this, wrote, We need to respond just like they are responding. We need to give them nail for nail and hit for hit. And I'm going... Wrong. We're not the world. Our speech is different. We do need to respond, but in our response, we need to control our emotions and our writings and our words to try to promote that which is healthy. That when they get done, they can say, I don't like what he said, but he sure said it nice. I don't believe what he said, but he's a nice guy. When they get done dealing with you, if they have this hatred and animosity for your character, you did something wrong. If you leave a discussion with the world and they love you for what you said, you said something wrong. And finding out how to say that, where you can stand for what God said, and at the same time you will be upright and holy and sound in your character. You need to give it some thought. Don't just sit down and respond when somebody just spouts off at work and you're sitting there don't just respond think about it think about how you're going to respond think about how you sound when you respond think about what you look like when you respond because in our response We want that to be which the opponent cannot come back. And if they did slander us, they would end up being ashamed, realizing we're not that kind of people. In all of our speech, in our manner of speech, the vocabulary that we use, the expression on our face and our body language, whatever you do in word or in deed, it is to bring glory unto God and unto Jesus. The Bible says that they are to do such in order that the Word of God is not reviled. That's hard. Because the world doesn't like the moral standard that God gave in the Bible. And yet at the same time, they're enamored and in love with the moral standard that God put in the Bible. If they can pick and choose which parts they want. But the idea that you are supposed to be kind and merciful and sober-minded and healthy-minded and of good vocab, that part's good. And when you get done, they ought to walk away. I listened to a debate not long ago on uh, the existence of God. 
And it was absolutely interesting debate. It wasn't a good debate. But the interesting thing was how spiteful the unbeliever was in what he said and did. And the response of the believer was to just present his case. That's the way it ought to be. We are to defend truth. So I don't defend what anybody said in the newspaper. That's what they said. In fact, the matter is, we really don't need to defend ourselves. But we need to stand for what's true. This gets us in trouble, for example, when you make a statement and then somebody challenges it. If you are there to defend yourself, you may very well end up denying truth. Because it may just be what you said was wrong. And if that be the case, the last thing in the world that you want to do is defend what you said. So don't set out to defend somebody else. So much of what was written on Facebook and in the news this week ended up to being this this chitter-chatter back and forth about he said this, he didn't say this, he said... We don't need that. It doesn't matter what he said. What matters, what did God say? And to make our arguments and to make our presentation and to make our discussion, pull it back to where it needs to be. This is not about what I think. This is about what God said. Now, that's going to be a hard sell in the polemic field today. They don't want to talk about that. But I believe that we as God's people need to pull it back to that field. And as we have this discussion, we don't just respond in kind. We don't give back in the same anger and venting that they did. One writer said, Well, he's mallard-brained, because that was cute. And another one was a little more generic. He said, of all the duck-brained philosophies of life, I'll tell you what, that accomplished absolutely nothing. It did not tell you anything about what is right and wrong. It did not promote the discussion. It did not help either side learn, why do I believe what I believe? We cannot revile when they revile. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and it talks about Jesus and what He did, and He set an example for us, and Peter said, when He was reviled, He reviled not again. Paul said in Romans, When we're evil spoken of, we respond with kindness and goodness. If we're going to live the life of Christianity, don't just live it on the issue of sexuality. We must live it on the whole issue of character of being godly. That includes the sexuality, but it also includes how we conduct ourselves in these types of discussions and scenarios. I'm absolutely convinced there's a lot of preachers this morning that are preaching about this subject that are violating everything that I'm talking about this morning. And it won't do a bit of good for either side. The goal, Paul said, in all of this sound teaching was that God may grant unto them repentance and knowledge of the truth. And if what you do is a diatribe and name calling, that does not bring repentance. It brings hard feelings. 
You may find out that you're a better name caller than they are. And that proved what? So our goal in our teaching and responding to these situations is to promote godliness in their lives as well as ours. And as we do this, remember, if you will, where the real debate is, is not about what some man said, when asked a question. Because the man answered the question according to a standard that he accepted on what was right and wrong. And the real discussion and debate can't be had. Because the world has a different standard. I don't believe in multiple universes. But man, it almost looked like that. <laughs> because the world is making its moral standards according to... Who knows? One writer said, science. And I'm going to tell you what, I pushed my chair back and went and got another cup of coffee and said, i got to think about this for a moment. How does science tell us what is moral? It's not, not the realm. Another one wrote that really the answer is medical institutions and papers. And I know doctors can sometimes tell you why you're sick, but the problem is they have no, no, no basis from which to speak on morality. So where is the standard on morality? That's where the debate is. We're all sitting here and you all believe, well, I think most of you do, I can see <laughs> most faces I know. All scriptures inspired of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So if you want to know what is moral, go to the Bible. That's the problem. They don't believe the Bible is God's word. So entering into that type of a discussion will generate nothing that is profitable for the discussion. In the book of Isaiah, preachers often quote Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. God's word and God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. It's always interesting to me, if you just back up two verses to verse 6, what it says is, if you're going to come back to God, the wicked man's going to have to forsake his way. Why does a wicked man need to forsake his ways to come back to God? And the answer is because God's ways are not our ways. So what discussion would you have with a wicked man? And Isaiah says, the problem is, what standard are they using to describe wickedness? And many, many people... Their standard says, I'm not wicked. That, that's, that's what I read over and over and over again in these dialogues. And I'm going, according to your standard, you're not wicked, but according to my standard, that what you're doing is ungodly and unacceptable. So where do we need to argue about? Where do we need to discuss? And my answer is, we need to discuss where the authority is. Because until that gets decided, you can't have this discussion. I'm just warning you. If you go to school or you go to work or you go down here to the mall and you try to have this discussion with somebody that thinks the Bible is nothing more than a comic book, 
you can't have this discussion. You will need to change the discussion to talk about why you believe the Bible is the Word of God. But you know what I found? Most of us are not equipped for that discussion. I wished we were all equipped for that discussion. And I wished in arguing about homosexuality, we could spend our time with the people at work, showing that what God said is the Word of God. Because I'm going to be honest with you, There's only six passages in all of the New Testament and Old Testament combined that really deal with that issue of morality. And you don't need to be a Bible scholar to show what the Bible teaches on that subject. But I believe all of the subjects really end up being the same way. Religious world is divided over what you have to do to be saved. But the Bible talks about it. And if we frame the question is, what did the Bible say I knew need to do to be saved? You can answer that question. Mark chapter 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's what it says. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. That's what it says. The biggest problem I found is with the majority of the world. You can quote that until you run out of air. They don't believe they're lost. And if they were lost... The Bible surely doesn't have an answer. And so you're back to where I said we need to spend our time and talk about. I'm going to challenge, particularly you young people. Don't shy away from the debate. Jump in with both feet. Jump in with both feet, though, conducting yourselves in a godly fashion and decide for yourself where the debate is. Don't be drawn in to the areas that are not profitable. Prepare yourself. Study. Learn. Memorize. And when you are then prepared for the debate, jump in with both feet and glorify God in all that you say and do. So, what do I think? I think we have a tempest in a teapot. I think this will all blow over until somebody else is asked, what do you think? And when they say, then we'll have this all over again, and we're going to see this week after week after week, and year after year after year, and we're going to be dead and on our grave, and our grandchildren are going to be having this same fruitless Debate. Because they won't debate what needs to be debated. Learn and choose your battles. Don't be drawn in, but choose where you're going to fight and how you're going to fight and what you're trying to accomplish when you have these discussions. And if you're not a Christian, I'm going to tell you what you need to be. And the way you need to do that is do what God said. And God said, if you believe in Jesus and you will be baptized for your sins, you can be saved. And if you're willing to take your stand for God, we invite you to do that. As together we stand and as we sing.